Hello everyone, and welcome back to Chess Openings Explained. Uh, tonight, by Ben Simon's count on our YouTube title, is part 8 of the F3 Nimzo, and it is going to be the finale tonight if we get through everything I want to get through. Um, so what's left? Well, we've covered most of pretty much everything in the F3 Nimzo, and uh, what's left is pretty much uh, some sidelines that I think are very much worth knowing that will show up in your games. Uh, these are lines that maybe aren't even the greatest for black uh, at the objective level, but they are natural ways to play, and you definitely will face these sometimes in your own games. Uh, and then if we get through all of that, I wanted to share one or two of my favorite games in the F3 Nimzo that really highlight why the opening is so good for, uh, for white. So let's jump right into it here. Uh, to start with, I have a game between uh, Timofeyev and Tarlov in some Russian Open tournament, I believe. Uh, and this game starts, of course, in our F3 Nimzo uh, here after F3. And now the sideline that I want to talk about is actually here on move four, the move knight c6. Uh, this is something that is quite rare, but does uh, have a little bit of bite to it. There is an idea with the move of knight c6. Of course, in previous lectures, we've covered all the nuances after d5, the various plans there, the various ideas with the move c5, and the flexible kingside castles. And so knight c6 is definitely a change from those moves that we have uh, we have been covering. So what is the idea of knight c6? Well, in a sense, it's like the move c5 in that it's fighting for the dark squares in the center of the board quite early on. But of course, it's not c5. Uh, it's just a knight attacking the central squares, which can be a little bit less threatening than the pawn itself, right? The knight's never really threatening to take here, so long as we have that square covered enough times. So because of that, because c5 is a much more immediate threat uh, than knight c6, white is actually just able to continue with the move e4 here. Uh, no reason to not play our planned idea of e4. Black has really not done enough to stop it with this move of knight c6. It increases the central pressure, but not to the point where white needs to be worried and deviate from our idea of e4. And from here, black has two ways of playing. Number one is to go with d5 and transpose into some of those structures. Uh, and the other idea is to play e5. And now I'm going to start with e5 because I think it's the most in line, actually, with the knight c6 idea. It now continues the fight for the dark squares, and I think it's the most testing. But we'll look at uh, d5 after this game. And here, white has two different options, and I definitely prefer one over the other. Uh, one option for white is to sort of relent to black's pressure in the center and play the move d5. But I think this is sort of giving black uh, what he wants out of the opening. Uh, now black can sink this knight on d4, and I think this is essentially the, the whole point of putting this knight on c6. It was to play e5 and get a knight into the d4 square, something that definitely wouldn't be possible in the comparable c5 line when white is going to play d5 right away, and there's never any chance to play the knight out to c6. So that's the idea of this little nuance here with knight c6 and e5. But fortunately, white has a pretty easy way to deal with this, and that's to simply play the move a3. Uh, black doesn't really have a good response to this move, uh, no matter what. Uh, probably best is to simply capture on c3 here, but now white is going to be able to reinforce this center. And after d6, we're going to get positions that uh, you likely are familiar with from previous lectures, uh, where black goes for this sort of d6, e5, dark squared setup. But it is sort of a little bit awkward that this knight is standing in front of this pawn for the moment, and it's just not the most sensible setup for black. Uh, that being said, I did want to show how this game could continue, because it was a very nice game by Timofeyev. Uh, and it really does show why this setup is, is maybe not the greatest for black with this knight on c6. So the game did continue with bishop e3. The, this is the most natural developing move, in my opinion. No, needs, no need to bring this bishop out to g5. It does well on e3, supporting the center, pressuring the king's side. And uh, the, the added defense to d4 is definitely going to be very relevant here. Uh, now we see knight d7 by uh, Timofeyev's opponent. And this is a little bit of a strange move, but it does give this f-pawn some mobility, and it begins walking this knight over to uh, other squares, perhaps back to f8 in some instances, and over to f4. Uh, now, 
Timofeyev just continues with bishop d3, and you can really see why this setup isn't great by black. It just doesn't put enough pressure on white's center, right? This knight and this e-pawn together just aren't enough to make any meaningful threats on the d4 pawn. This bishop alone is enough to defend it, and then white has no problems developing very naturally with bishop d3. Uh, and if you think back to previous lectures, if you have watched them all, uh, in situations like this, where white is able to develop with bishop d3 in this sort of structure without fearing for the d4 pawn safety, white does tend to be a little bit better. Uh, in the game, Tarlov continues with knight a5, trying to go for this plan of putting pressure on white's queenside uh, deficiencies. And now the simplest is to do what Timofeyev did in the game, and that's just break through with f4. Uh, Black's setup is so much worse comparatively to similar positions that white can actually just break with f4 directly here. Uh, in previous instances, we've seen similar structures where white has to work a little bit harder to play the move f4, but in this case, black is sort of just stepping on his own toes with these knights, and Timofeyev is correct in just immediately breaking with this move of f4. Uh, that being said, it doesn't really make an immediate threat. White isn't immediately looking to, to capture on e5 or immediately play e5. It's just opening up this diagonal, increasing the pressure here, and uh, passing the turn back to, to black. So Tarlov does continue now with b6, and this is a plan we've seen before by black attacking the c4 pawn, but white has nothing to fear here. Natural development now with knight f3. Bishop a6 is easily parried by queen e2, defending the c4 pawn. And now black's play is just too slow in comparison to white's. We see kingside castles. And now uh, a difference between previous variations and most of the variations that we've looked at here. Black has in fact castled kingside, but due to the move order, black has the option to castle queenside. But this uh, change in king location is actually very debatable uh, whether or not it actually favors black. Uh, the queen side is definitely not the safest place in the world for this king either. And white has, you know, many, many paths to an advantage here. One of which is to just take on e5, open up the f-file, and maybe a more direct way is what Timofeyev chose to do in the game with the move c5. Opening up this diagonal and ready to open up files in front of this black king. Uh, this game continued with takes on d3, takes on d3, and black tries to capture on c5 to keep things a bit more closed. And now after queen a6 check, king b8, f takes e5. Uh, white now has three pawns to zero, which is a bigger central advantage than most people can ever hope to achieve. And white is just significantly, significantly better. Uh, I will eventually show you the, the rest of this game because I think it is sort of nice. But um, this is where I think uh, the, the openings uh, are, are really decided. This is well out of opening now well into the middle game, and it's very, very clear that it's white who's on the better side with the central control, the safer king. Black's pieces are, you know, in a sense, a bit misplaced, and really no problems at all for white here. But uh, I want to open up to questions for the chat room. This is the first time we're looking at this knight c6 move. Is anybody confused about these ideas? Does anybody not remember uh, what we're doing in these types of structures. This f4 break, I know, is critical. So, so questions and confusion in the chat. What do you guys have for me? Mm -mm. So yeah, if you're watching live, feel free to ask me any questions. And then um, it will be recorded and saved on the channel forever and ever and ever. All right, well then, let me review this really quickly, and I, I will go on to show you some more of the game. But just to review how we got here, what were the other moves instead of knight c6? Well, the first seven lectures were about d5, c5, and kingside castles. So now we're, we're just focusing in on knight c6. Mm -mm. Uh, OK, so how did we get here? So knight c6, the idea being to apply some pressure to these dark squares. But it's not as severe as c5, so white is perfectly able to continue now with e4. Black's idea that we're going to look at is e5. We'll look at the move d5 next. This is the main alternative. Uh, e5, and now this does apply enough pressure here to warrant a response by white, but we can just play this move a3. Black's best response is to play bishop takes c3, and now white is going to be able to keep control of the d4 square. It'd be a bit of a mistake, I think, to play d5, because this is sort of what black wanted out of the opening, to get this knight on d4. Uh, now I've reminded myself I should talk about the move e takes d4, 
This is a legal option, but it does just lead to an advantage for white after takes on b4, takes on c3, uh, and takes back on, on c3, or even the move b5 first. This is just going to be a good position for white. The bishop pair, this pawn on d6, is never arriving on the d5 square, and this is just a, a clean advantage. So much so that no games actually have, have made it to this point. But so bishop takes c3 instead. Now we have good control over here, and black has a comparatively worse position uh, related to similar structures that we've seen because the pressure on d4 is not strong enough to prevent the move of bishop d3 by white. And then we just saw some development. We saw knight a5. It, it does not make a difference if black plays b6, by the way. This was a question I saw in the chat. And then we see this break of f4 uh, coming quite early on, not with any immediate intentions, but just allowing this knight to develop up behind it to f3. And then we came here. C5 was a nice idea to open up files and diagonals in front of this king. And then after takes, we see white capturing on e5, getting the central majority, and a very nice game. Uh, from here, Timofeyev did mess up a little bit with uh, moves like bishop f4. Better was just to bring this rook anywhere into the game. And this rook anywhere into the game, really any of these rook moves would have been great. Uh, bishop f4 isn't bad either, though. White maintains an advantage. See rook c8, rook a e1. Take on e5, take on e5, take on d4, take on d4, take on e5, take on e5. And now we do just get some simplifications, uh, but still these very much favor white with the safer king, control of the open file, and central control leads to a, a better uh, minor piece in the form of the knight on e5 versus the knight on a5. Pretty clear to see which of these knights is superior. Begin to continue with queen d6. And again, I don't want to show too much of this because this is sort of only tangentially related to our opening now. But Timofeyev does go on to win this game using this nice central control and a little tactic to win a pawn. And now, eventually, goes on to win this endgame. We don't need to know the details. Endgame's not the focus of this class. Um, OK, so that is the idea of knight c6 and e5. And wow, we have someone who's played Timofeyev in the chat. That's exciting. Mm -mm. Why not take e5 instead of a3? Um, because this is sort of buying into Black's idea of controlling some of the dark squares, right? Now this knight is going to have a nice outpost on e5, whereas in our main variation, this knight sort of gets relegated to a5. It does apply pressure to c4, but we've already seen that that pressure is not enough to make a difference in white's play. So this just sort of allows black to have a, a pretty active minor piece. D takes e5, though, definitely not the worst move on the board. This is playable for white, but I do think a3 leads to sort of a tangible advantage, where d takes e5 allows black at least to have squares for the pieces. For example, this bishop might even end up on this diagonal. And yeah, this position is perfectly fine, though. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but now let us move on to our second idea, which is what happens if black plays the move d5. And to do so, I'm going to flip to another, ga another game, this time between two players known as uh, Mikhail uh, Ulubin and Sergei Tvyakov. Uh, hopefully I didn't do too badly there. And if you notice the results of this game, uh, Ulubin actually did end up losing, but that was after uh, a, a pretty enormous advantage out of the opening. So no fault of the f3 nimzo there. Sometimes you lose chess positions where you are supposedly better. Uh, and my laptop seems to have frozen. I'm going to refresh the page here, <laughs> and we'll keep going. But uh, yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> Progress is not being made on the laptop front here. Um, let's see what we can do here. Yeah, flip to me for a second. Let's go ahead and exit the page. All right. We seem to be recovering on the laptop front. Aw, oh, snap. Aw, oh, snap, dude. All right, we're back. We're back. Great. <laughs> uh, all right, so here's our game, Knight of Six. And as I was saying, Ulubin did go on to lose, but had a very nice advantage out of the opening. And I think it was just strictly winning at some point. So it is a good model game to follow, in my opinion. We have bishop b4, f3, once again knight c6, e4, and then black's other idea is to play d5. So this idea is, in my opinion, a little bit more counterintuitive than the move of e5 in combination with this move, knight to c6. 
Uh, but basically, the idea here is that black has sort of baited white into playing the move e4, uh, and has done so with a, a useful waiting move, perhaps more useful than kingside castles in some cases. So now, uh, black is essentially baiting white into playing the move e5, which white can and, and should do in many cases. And then he's going to use this knight to apply a little bit of pressure to this pawn on d4. So it is a similar idea to this move of e5. It's still rooted in attacking the d4 pawn, but uh, perhaps a little bit less intuitively so. Uh, so how should white respond to this? Well, there's really nothing to fear here. Uh, as normal, we are actually going to want to play the move c takes d5. Uh, and now after e takes d5, only now are we going to play the move e5. Uh, notably, it's probably not such a good idea to try and just continue normal development, something like bishop b5, for example, because now, uh, okay, well, for one, our e-pawn is hanging, and number two, I was going to say, black is happy to open up the d-file to apply some extra pressure to the d4-pawn as, as well. So a lot to look out for here, which is why we should just play the move e5. Now, why insert c takes d5 and e takes d5? It seems as though it opens up this bishop, but the fact of the matter is this bishop doesn't have too many useful squares on this diagonal that it's going to be able to occupy. And more importantly, uh, it, it gives us this nice central 2v1 advantage. And this opening is really about building a central advantage for white, and we can, can very much do so with c takes d5. Uh, additionally, if black ever does capture on c3, we're not really going to want to be left with, with double pawns there as well. So cd5, e5, and e5 is my choice. Uh, and here, the move knight g8 is the move that should be played. Uh, and this move well, is potentially counterintuitive, but basically knight h5 just leaves this knight a little bit too stranded after any normal move, such as bishop e3, such as g3. This knight is just a little bit stuck over here, as we've seen in other lines with knight h5. And knight g8 is actually not as bad as it may seem, because this knight is simply headed for the f5 square, where it is going to work well with the knight on c6. Uh, now, there are actually a variety of ways you can play this position. Uh, by far, the most common is to push through with f4 or, or bishop e3. And I think both of these moves are fine, but the, the deeper I dug into it, I thought potentially black is just able to equalize with pretty standard moves, right? Bringing the knight out to f5 one way or the other, uh, and, and just a applying pressure to this pawn on d4, potentially even going bishop a5, bishop b6, and, and really stacking up uh, against d4. Uh, just sort of classical compensation that you see in openings like the Karo Khan, openings like, like the French, just a weakness on d4. Uh, but the move that I found is the third most popular in the move played in this game of bishop b5. I think this is a really great way for white to uh, just seize the advantage straight out of the opening against this knight c6 d5 idea. Uh, black can respond with either knight e7 or bishop d7. I think bishop d7 is a bit better. Against knight e7, uh, it's really not going to change our plans. We're still just going to develop out uh, pretty normally, either with knight e2 or with f4, knight f3. Uh, so let's just focus on bishop d7. Again, the, the ideas really aren't that different. It's just that bishop d7 is a bit more forcing in making white take this knight off the board uh, directly, rather than being able to lay things after knight e7 uh, when the knight would still be pinned. Uh, okay, so bishop d7, and now our idea is in fact actually to just take this knight on c6 off the board. And this might be a little bit uh, counterintuitive to some of you who have been classically trained into thinking this is our good bishop, right? This is our great, this is our good bishop. It's so good. It's such a good bishop. Why are we giving it up? Well, the point here is that black's play really revolves around uh, pressuring these pawns in the center. And if black is unable to do that, then black is simply going to be going to be worse, right? We have enough of this central advantage that if we can just maintain these center pawns, white is, is going to be better. And that's why we're willing to give up this light square bishop for this knight, which was doing a good job of, of pressuring our central pawns. Uh, the game continues now with bishop takes c6 and f4. Uh, and I think this is just a perfectly fine way of developing out for white. Uh, now, uh, Tiviakov plays the move queen d7, we see knight out to f3, and black now decides it is time to snap off this knight on c6 before going any further. Black doesn't necessarily have to do this right away, but it's, it's not necessarily the worst idea either. 
uh, mainly because that knight was doing a great job of hampering this bishop and pressuring d5 itself uh, once this king gets castled. Uh, now, Tiviakov continues through with bishop to a4, forcing this queen off of the square and activating this bishop just a little bit. We see now queen d2, bishop back to b5, uh, harassing the king a bit, and that's why we see uh, Ulibin just bring the king out to, to f2 instead of castling. And we've seen this before in the f3 Nimzo, and I want to reiterate, this is just a, a very common way to quote-unquote castle the king. You don't necessarily have to do it literally by castling. Uh, F2 is often a safe enough square for the king when you have such a massive dominate, domination in, in the center. And, and that's the case here. Uh, this game now continues with black castling queenside once again, as we saw earlier in the knight c6 variation. But after the move a4, uh, bishop a6, and bishop a3, uh, white is, is simply better here once again. Uh, the king on f2 is actually going to prove to be safer than the king on c8 and white is, is happy to play on the queen side of the board. Uh, this game continues now with the move h5, and now after bishop c5, there's some awkwardness to, to answer for on this queen side. Black doesn't really want to play the move b6, because this is a little bit of a hook for white to open things up on the queen side, so we see king b8 instead. Now rook h to e1 helps support the center, and in this position, it's going to be rather tough for black to keep everything under control, because there are very much two threats that black needs to be pairing. Uh, number one is pressure down the B file and on the queen side against the black king. And number two are threats of pushing this E pawn forward with something like F5 and, and E6. And because of these two threats, I do think that, that white has a, a pretty nice position uh, in this case. Uh, the game, though, did not continue totally according to plan. We saw rook ag8, rook a to b1, king a8, now a5. And so far, so good for white. I think the, the position is, is pretty balanced here. But eventually, things do start to slip. Uh, as we see after rook b8, knight h4, queen g4, knight back to f3, uh, h3. And I'm sort of super skimming through these moves because they're not the most important. But this break of f5 is, is what I wanted to get to. Uh, after this move, white was very much better and was able to, uh, to go on with a winning advantage, although they did not end up winning the game. So that's the key idea I wanted to highlight there. Uh, the, the maneuvering beforehand wasn't strictly the, the most important to, to remember the exact moves, but white's idea is to push through with f5 and now eventually push through with either at, uh, either e6 or f6 and, and a winning advantage. Once f5 is on the board, it's very, very clear that white is doing very, very well in this game. So how do we get there specifically, if you are curious? Well, this move, knight h4, is one to look at. Beginning to gain control of f5, then uh, we see this knight come back, this queen come to f2, h3 drives the black queen away, and now f5 is simply very, very difficult for black to stop, and white has a nice edge. So questions about how we got here. Questions on this before I do a quick little review of what it, what it was. Mm. Why not wait on capturing on c6 with the bishop? Well, I think black is actually making a threat here. Um, that's, that's why we need to, uh, to do it right away. If you play something like f4, I think knight takes c5 is going to be a good tactic here. Queen e2 doesn't quite work uh, because this knight is, is actually pinned. And we're keeping everything together with black, just barely. That's a good question, though. So bishop d7, that's why this move is better than knight e7, in my opinion, uh, because it, it does force the immediate captures, rather than allowing white to wait and, and maybe change, change their mind if things were to change. Uh, OK. Yeah, well, well then let me do a quick review of this idea, and then we will move on to the next. So here we're looking at knight c6, e4. We talked about e5 when a3 is a good response for white. Now against d5, I'm recommending the main stuff here. We take on d5, push through with e5, and against knight g8, I like this idea of bishop b5 to immediately remove the pressure on the center that black's knight is exuding. Bishop d7 is the best move uh, because it forces the immediate captures uh, due to the threat of knight takes e5. So we take, bishop takes in this game, now f4, 
allows this knight to develop out behind the pawn. Uh, I should mention that perhaps knight e2 is, is even a better move with the idea of keeping control of some of these light squares uh, and just uh, taking a more conservative approach to the position. You can still eventually come through with f4 and f5. Uh, it, this move also, though, allows ideas uh, of stuff like knight g3. So knight e2, by the way, another great idea, perhaps even better than f4, but f4 is fine for white. Queen d7, knight f3. We see captures, captures now. Uh, as far as the question, should black keep the bishop pair? Uh, I mean, sure, you can leave this bishop on b4, but the question is, is it ever going to be more useful than this knight attacking the d5, uh, the d5 pawn? And, and I really don't see how, right? The center is very blocked. It's not really doing a good job on b6 because we sort of preemptively got rid of this pressure against our pawn. So I think taking on c3 is very reasonable. Uh, then we saw this subtle maneuvering, king f2, and then our last key idea that I wanted to highlight was this idea of pressure on the queen side combined with pressure on the king side with this break of f5. Okay, with all of that, let us move along. Uh, okay, what happens if bishop takes a4? So uh, I, I will say a4 isn't really the, the critical move here. Uh, you don't necessarily need <laughs> a4 included. Something like rook b1 is, is perfectly fine as well. But a4, if you are playing this pawn sacrifice, in this case, uh, I, I don't know if there's anything immediate. M maybe queen a2 is good. Forcing something awkward like b5 and then still developing out behind it, just opening up files in front of the king. But yeah, like a4 isn't a super critical move in this position or anything. This isn't the type of thing you need to memorize. Uh, just have this idea. Pressure on the queen side on the open files. Moves like a4 are quite good. And then also threats of playing the move f5 once we are more developed. Uh, OK, let us continue on now. Uh, that's all I have on knight c6. But I wanted to talk about an idea that we've seen before. Uh, specifically, what happens after castles, a3, take, take, and knight h5. Right. So this is sort of the best incarnation of this knight h5 idea, and we talked about this in the, the lecture on kingside castles. But this move, knight h5, does have a habit of creeping up in very similar positions, but not identical positions. And those are all just, I think, strictly worse versions of the knight h5 idea. But be it through you know accident or on purpose, players with the black pieces are sometimes playing knight h5 when they, they really shouldn't be. So I think it's worth talking about. So to start with, I don't have a game. I just have some analysis I want to share. Uh, and this is what happens if black plays, oh boy. <laughs> All right, uh, Lee Chess and my computer seem to be struggling once again. So we'll give that some time to, to catch up here. But as I was going to say, we're going to first analyze what happens if black just plays knight h5 straight on move four, right? We're looking at these strange uh, ideas for black on move four tonight, these strange sidelines that, that aren't played too often. And uh, yeah, definitely knight h5 on move four is one of those. Aw, oh, snap! Something went wrong. All right, but we're back in action now. I don't know why this is so important, but OK. Don't know why we need to wait for the page to officially crash before we can move along. But if that's the way it must be, that's the way it must be. So knight h5 immediately. Why wait? Why castle first? Why not just put the knight on h5? It's a great question. Well, the answer is because it doesn't do anything, right? We saw that the idea of this knight h5 move uh, in the line where we castle is that after a3 here, knight h5, uh, now we are, first of all, unable to play e4 because queen h4 check is very strong. And if we prepare it with knight h3, black is in time to stop e4 with the move f5. Then, for example, uh, e4 is met by takes, takes, and queen h4 check when again uh, black is going to be winning. So my remedy to this, uh, in short, in that lecture was to play knight f2 first, then continue with e4, and white has a perfectly reasonable position. For example, d6, e4 was, was the main line. So what's different if black just does it outright, right away, plays knight h5? Well, the answer is the only differences are, are good for white. We still play knight h3 because e4 uh, still loses to, to queen h4 check. Uh, now, again, if queen h4, we have the move g3 or knight f2, either is perfectly fine. Uh, 
So f5 has to be the idea for black. Otherwise, why play knight h5? And the difference here is that f5 doesn't actually stop e4. And this is why knight h5 isn't uh, a common move on move 4. That's why it needs to be prefaced by castles. So for example, now we have not wasted a tempo with a3, b takes c3. That tempo instead has been used on knight h3. So we're allowed to just play e4 here, and white is, is much better. Uh, for example, the line that was working previously is no longer good, because we simply go knight f2, and there's no rook on f8 to uh, immediately checkmate us. Then, for example, if castles, bishop e3, white is pretty much just winning in this position. Uh, not much else to say here. This is quite good for white. g3 to follow, bishop g2, for example, bishop e2 even, castles. This knight looks silly, and white has total control over the center of the board. Uh, so better for black is to just castle and try desperately to transpose. Now, worst case here, you can play knight f2 and transpose to what we were talking about in a previous lecture. This pretty much directly transposes always if you include a3 and b takes c3, which, you know, why, why not include that? Uh, or you can try for a little bit more with the move uh, bishop e2. Bishop e2 is, is also perfectly fine here for white and maybe is a better attempt at quote unquote re refuting black's play uh, in this case. Uh, why is that? Well, now, uh, previously, where we had to first deal with these ideas uh, before we can castle our king, now white is just going to castle immediately and really, really have no problems uh, at, at all here. Really have no problems at all. Uh, okay, so for example, if f4, the immediate kingside castles is perfectly fine. And if f takes e4, uh, the idea is not going to be to take, when now queen h4 check would be quite strong but to simply castle, and this is going to be a good sacrifice now for, uh, for white. Just open diagonals for the bishops and active pieces in the center of the board. But if this stuff isn't your taste, if you don't want more, one more thing to learn, you can always just play knight f2 here. And this is pretty much exactly what we've talked about before. For example, d6, a3. This is literally the, the position from uh, a previous lecture. So that's the immediate knight h5, but that's not the only uh, position where knight h5 has been tried. So now I want to take a look at an old idea that was perhaps an imperfect version of the knight h5 idea. Uh, it hasn't really been seen at the top level in the past few years. I think the latest games are actually from 2010, 2011. Uh, but it did make an appearance in this game against one Robert James Fisher. Some of you may know but it didn't go very well for him. So let's see one more time uh, a slightly different instance of this knight h5 idea. Uh, we have d4, and we're going to take a minute here. <laughs> Once again, whenever I switch chapters, uh, I think the, the laptop just can't handle it. It just crashes. Um, so we'll let Google Chrome crash, crash one more time, uh, and then we'll, we'll continue on here. What am I sipping on? I've got some, some diet ginger ale. Diet ginger ale. For, for some reason. I don't know. Good question. Aw, oh, snap. All right. And we're back. And we're back. Knight f6, c4, e6. All right. Knight c3, bishop e4, f3. And then in this game, we're going to look at the idea appearing after d5 rather than kingside castles. Uh, so we have a3, take on c3, take on c3, castles, take on d5, uh, e takes d5, and e3. Uh, so this is a position we have looked at before. And of course, the main move here is c5. We, we looked at some, some other ideas for black as well in one of the, uh, maybe the first lecture, uh, where I talked about the d5 plans. But knight h5 is actually a legal move here as well. And the point of this move is to stop white's natural development with bishop d3. It's just basically aimed at making bishop d3 unplayable due to the idea of queen h4 check. Now, there are a variety of ways that white can deal with this. The simple move knight e2 is going to be perfectly fine for white. And maybe we would see something like g4, bishop e2. This bishop g2, this type of developing plan, uh, has been seen before. Uh, but I personally like the move queen c2 the best that was played in the game. 
what's the point of this move? Well, the point of this move is to parry the threat of queen h4, uh, sort of with tempo. Uh, now, white is threatening to play e4 himself in many cases, and queen h4 is no longer going to be a threat thanks to queen f2. Uh, also, by not playing knight e2, we still allow ourselves the option to play bishop d3, which would not be playable if knight e2 were white's choice. Uh, now, though, black can continue making immediate threats with the move rook e8. This is really the only justification for knight h5. Otherwise, white is just going to develop very, very normally. Now, if bishop d3, there are still some problems to deal with. For example, queen h4 check, queen f2. Knight f4 is some nasty, nasty business that you don't want to find yourself uh, dealing with. Of course, queen takes queen, so that by knight takes g2. Uh, so, best for white is to first play this move g4. Uh, now, the knight can still come to f4, and in fact is almost forced to, but white is ready to respond with the move h4, stopping queen h4 check from becoming a threat. Also notably, if queen h4 check here were to be played, now we are happy to do this because there's no time to play knight f4 anymore. Mm -mm. Yeah, and knight f4 here, of course, we can just take because our bishop still defends g2. Uh, okay, so g4, knight f4, h4 is the idea for white. And then after c5, uh, when in doubt, play the move king f2. This forces this knight back off of f4. And now after bishop d3, white can continue with the normal developing plan that we've seen before, just with some extra space on, on the king's side to boot, right? Well, let's see it as a positive here. Not weaknesses, extra space. Extra space for sure. Um, and I kind of do mean that, that seriously. Uh, it can be scary with your king looking so airy, but... Uh, Wow, I'm, I'm rhyming. Uh, but the extra space is going to be worth it, and I think this game does very well at uh, demonstrating it. And, and I'll show you the rest of the game uh, shortly. Although, actually, knight g6 was played in the game. But I went through that pretty fast, so let's take another look. Uh, step by step, knight h5 stops bishop d3 with the queen h4 check threat, so we go queen c2, parrying queen h4 with queen f2. Black continues to make threats with rook to e8, this also effectively stops bishop to d3 because queen h4 check with knight f4 is a strong idea. So white plays g4 to force the knight away. The knight still comes into f4. If it comes to f6, we again can just continue with natural development. No problems here. Knight f4 is the only way to continue posing problems. And now we go h4 to stop queen h4 check ourselves. Uh, the game continues with c5 and white eventually is able to untangle with the move king f2 forcing the knight back and allowing natural development. So questions on that, because I think this is where uh, the, the opening sort of starts to fade and the middle game starts to begin. Uh, these immediate problems that Black was posing uh, are no longer going to be so, so scary. Is this breeziness for the king a bit risky for newer players? I mean, it's uh, like, sure, uh, <laughs> anything is a bit risky for, for newer players, I would argue. Um, in this case, uh, I would argue that this is better for newer players than, than a lot of openings. Because I think the problem that newer players run into is not necessarily getting checkmated right away, but not really knowing what to do with their pieces. And as we'll see in this game, it's very clear what white should be doing with the pieces. And I think that makes up for, uh, for the slight weakness of the king. Uh, Pippin Joke has a line he'd like me to look at. Bishop d3, queen h4 check, king f1, knight g3 check. And you say, yeah, yeah this just isn't good, unfortunately. Uh, rooks are good, better in many cases than knights, and I don't think you're really going to be comfortable playing e4 here uh, after take take, for example. It's just a little bit too, too breezy, right? This queen is too active, the king is too weak, black's pieces have squares. It's going to be a little scary. Uh, so, better is just to play g4. Uh, all right, now let's see how the game continues. We have king f2. Uh, black shows knight g6 in the game. Knight e6 is also perfectly fine, but it's not going to change, ver change very much. Knight g6, we see bishop to d3. Uh, knight takes h4 isn't really going to be an option due to bishop takes h7. Uh, so, knight c6 played in the game. And now, simply knight e2 getting developed. Uh, bishop e6. And we do now see white push through with the move of g5. Uh, h5, by the way, also a perfectly playable idea, as some people in the chat were, were mentioning. 
but in the game, White chose this way to, to continue, and probably for good reason, because it seemed to work out well. Uh, rook c8 was played in the game. Uh, notably, black doesn't really have uh, any way to lock things down on the king's side of the board. If you touch this h-pawn, trying something like h5, I'm, I'm just going to snap on g6 and be a pawn to the good. So rook c8 is what Bobby Fischer came up with, trying to apply pressure down the c-file. Uh, but now white just rolls through black's position with h5 and g6 to follow. And this is just a, a tough position for black. Uh, fg6 was played, hg6, h6 now, trying to lock things up. But queen b1 steps off the c-file. And uh, as I said, it's pretty clear what white is doing. White is attacking on the king's side. Black is trying to find some play down the c-file, but it's all a little bit vague. And I'm not sure what specific threats black is actually going to be able to, to generate on this side of the board. And that can lead to some real practical difficulties uh, for black. Uh, and it was too much for Bobby Fischer to handle. I'm willing to wager it's too much for a lot of class level players to handle <laughs> as well. So. Uh, Bobby tried knight a5, which is an idea that is very natural, an idea that we've seen before in these f3 nimzo positions, uh, where black is just going for, for play on the queen's side of the board. But now white continues with knight f4, and the pressure on the king's side proves to be more relevant than the queen's side pressure. Uh, c4 was Bobby Fischer's attempt trying to get a stronghold on uh, b3. Maybe it's a better attempt to keep the option open to open the c-file, but uh, you know black has problems there as well. Uh, namely the fact that you, you just can't generate any concrete threat on this side of the board, really. So c4 was the attempt, followed by rook c6, going for pressure down the b-file. Rook a2 is a nice move that we've seen before to bring this rook into the game. Uh, now knight d7 tries to reactivate this knight. Uh, a4 once again comes into play, this case uh, with the idea of activating the bishop on a3, as we see. Now rook b2 applies pressure on this side of the board as well. Rook b5, and yeah, sort of black is, is fighting a battle uh, on three fronts at this point. There's a weakness on d5, there's threats of opening things up on the queen side with uh, something like a5, there's threats on the king side with this pawn on g6, and, and actually I lied, it's, it's a fight on four fronts, because white's now playing e4, and, and breaking through in the center, right? White just has an advantage sort of on, on every, every side of the board. Uh, tough to argue with with that. And white now is, in fact, uh, just, just strictly winning. Uh, knight b7 was perhaps the final mistake. Uh, the computer likes knight b3 instead, but th this move is, is also pretty bad in, in light of ideas, uh, simply like e4 as well. Uh, so knight b7, e4, and it's just pretty busted now for, um, for black. Uh, white actually takes with the bishop. Notably, f takes is not really going to be the idea here. Uh, just because it, it uh, perhaps makes a few too many weaknesses uh, around this, this white king. We don't need to open the f-file, lose control of g4. So e4, the idea was to take with the bishop and apply pressure down this side of the board. We see knight takes e4, or we don't see knight takes e4, but if we did, it would just be replied to by queen takes e4. And the, the same awkwardness sort of persists here. If you try something like bishop f5, for example, well, sorry, you can't, you can't really move this bishop, because uh, I would take it. And yeah, like rook e5 is coming, it's, it's just all, all a disaster. So bishop takes e4, rook c to c8 was played, but now still rook e5. And uh, at the end of the day, when the dust settles here, uh, we'll see that Bobby Fischer is just getting slaughtered. Extra bishop for white, and that is enough to win the game. Uh, those tactics, once again, I did just sort of flip through them, but pressure on this bishop. So Bobby tries bishop g4, but now just knight d5 is played, take take is an in-between move. Now we take here, even material for the moment, but what do you do with this bishop? The answer is you, you can't do anything with this bishop. You come back here. Um, even this is good enough. Uh, queen c1 to h6 is good enough. Everything is winning. Uh, so uh, Bobby gives up the bishop instead, and from here goes on to lose the game because white has more bishops, and bishops are good. Right? Free queen. White is winning. So questions on this game and this knight h5 idea in particular. It's a little bit different than the previous knight h5 ideas. It's not with the intention of stopping e4 with this f5 move. It's just with the intention of making development awkward for white with the move of bishop to d3 no longer being playable, as we saw, if I can flip back. 
bishop d3, losing to queen h4, right? And one more time, just to review, our idea is to go queen c2, pairing queen h4 with queen f2, also supporting e4. After rook e8, the only move to continue applying pressure, we go g4 to kick the knight away, and eventually h4 to stop queen h4, and king f2 to force the knight back. And then we saw that white has an advantage sort of on every side of the board, with threats of pushing e4, threats on the queen side down the b file, and threats on the king side with the pawn storm that we saw in the game. So, questions on this one. Questions here. Would I enjoy playing white in this variation? Well, I, I think white is objectively better in this variation, so I, I tend to like positions where I'm objectively better. Sometimes I like positions where I'm objectively worse, even. But generally, I like the ones where I'm better. Uh, if c4 for black and the g4, h4 line, do you just take the knight on g6? Uh, let's see what we're talking about here. We're talking about c4. Um, you can do any number of things. Maybe you take with the, the bishop on g6, and the point now is that y you get to open the h file. You don't necessarily want a piece, but uh, I think this is pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, okay, so with that, I'm going to attempt to switch chapters here on Lee Chess. I'm going to turn off the computer evaluation, and I'm going to very, very gingerly click next chapter. It works! We didn't freeze. Okay, wait. Wait, the knight is still young, and I can make moves. Okay. And we're continuing. All right, life is good. Life is good. Look at us go. All right, no freezing. It's a little bit delayed, but I, I'll trust it. Knight c3, bishop b4, f3, b6. Okay, so this is the, the last idea I want to introduce tonight. Um, it's the idea of basically, what if black decides, I was kidding about playing the Nimzo Indian, I meant to play a queen's Indian defense. And while this is not a very good way to play, I think this is something you'll sort of run into with some people playing the Nimzo Indian. Uh, why is that? Well, uh, I've talked before about d5 perhaps being the natural plan. And why I say this is the natural plan and the plan you run into a lot is because a lot of players with the Nimzo Indian, they see the move f3, they hit the panic button, and they say, all right, I don't know what's going on here. I'm just going to play good solid moves. And speaking from experience as a Nimzo Indian player with myself with the black pieces, Whenever I hit the panic button, I tend to just go back and default to, to Queen's Indian ideas. Uh, this sort of setup, bring the bishop to b7, control the center from the outside. This is like how the Queen's Indian works, right? If I don't know what's going on in my Nimzo lines, I can usually just default to playing the Queen's Indian defense. And I think this is the, the same thinking for, for some players. So it's worth knowing what to do if black randomly plays b6. Now, not a very good move. You're not going to see this at a very high level of play. Uh, you know, 99.5% of the time, you're just not going to see the move b6. But I still wanted to talk about it, because you might run into it practically in your games. So as with any move that doesn't directly challenge our center, uh, for example, c5 challenges our center, d5 challenges our center, uh, whenever black does not challenge our center, we're going to play the move e4. Uh, now, black has a variety of things that they can do for example castles is the main thing i'm going to focus on but bishop takes c3 is something you might see immediately as well and the idea here is once again to go for this dark squared plan sometimes players with the black pieces just sort of strong arm their way into it but it's just going to be similar to what we looked at i think actually last lecture but black has randomly included the move b6 seemingly for for no reason so so white should of course be fine here once again we see that Black has not applied enough pressure to the d4 pawn to prevent white's natural setup with the bishop on d3 and the knight on e2. And for that reason, white is a little bit better here. Uh, just for example, this was some game between two random people um, named Konovalov and Mayorov and Mayorov. From somewhere, they weren't that good at chess. But this is just a reasonable setup for white that I wanted to highlight. Uh, OK, and white is going to be better, again, because of the natural setup good squares for this knight, and eventually we can think about playing an f4 break, or a c5 break, or an a4, a5, and any of these ideas are going to be perfectly fine for white. So that's bishop takes c3. If black sort of stays true to the queen's Indian defense idea and just castles king's side, uh, we have no fear here. Just play bishop d3, continue normal development, and you will be better. 
Uh, for example, c5, d5, e takes d5, c takes d5 was uh, played in some game. d6, knight e2. Uh, and this is where I, I sort of ended my analysis here. This stuff really doesn't appear uh, too often. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight that this looks very, very similar to our positions that we see after four c5, with the exception that black has played uh, or has wasted an entire tempo playing the move b6, when oftentimes this pawn just belongs on b5. So for those reasons, these are really just going to be worse versions of stuff we've already looked at, but I thought it was worth mentioning this tricky move order. Uh, okay, so with the last few minutes here, I want to go over perhaps my favorite game in the F3 Nimzo, which is a little bit of a lie, because it's not even a game in the F3 Nimzo. It's a game between uh, Mikhail Botvinnik and Jose Raul Capablanca from 1938. Uh, Botvinnik Capablanca, Avro 1938. It's a great, great game. It doesn't start in the F3 Nimzo, but they, they find their way there uh, eventually. So let's take a look here. I think this is sort of the, the quintessential F3 Nimzo game. If I had to pick one that truly embodies the opening, I think it would be this game, which is ironic, because it didn't start in the F3 Nimzo. But anyways, let's just take a look here. We have d4, and uh, we have a Nimzo Indian, but white starts with e3. Uh, we'll see that after d5, a3, take, take. Uh, we see the move c5, cd5, ed5, and this should be looking pretty familiar here. If you insert the moves f3 and kingside castles, then you just have an F3 Nimzo. So it's just a different move order to arrive at uh, stuff we, we've already seen. White starts by developing the bishop with bishop d d3, black castles kingside, sorry, excuse me, and you could play f3 now and once again transpose, but white just continues delaying it with knight e2, no reason not to. Uh, b6 now for black, and black is aiming to trade off the light squared bishops, as discussed, I think, in lecture number one. Black really should be trying to trade off these bishops. The bishop on d3 is just always better than the counterpart on c8. Uh, so kingside castles, uh, bishop a6, we see bishop takes a6, knight takes a6, uh, and then white continues delaying the move f3 with the move bishop to b2. So maybe I, I am wrong in calling this an f3 Nimzo game, but really, you know, the, the f3 is sort of implied at this point. White is going to play f3 and push for e4, and you can tell this by the move bishop b2. With this move, white is, uh, you know, sort of uh, adding support for the d4 pawn. Uh, the only reason you need to do that is if you're planning to move your e pawn to e4. The only way you're moving your e pawn to e4 is if you, if you play the move f3. So just some move order tricks here, but white is planning to play the move f3 and push forward. Uh, this game continues with queen to d7. And now Botvinnik starts playing some really nice moves that I think you can uh, lear learn a lot from here. So what are the ideas in this structure? Well, we know White's idea. White's idea is to push f3 and e4, as I keep saying. But what is Black's idea? How does Black find counterplay? Well, we've seen in previous games that Black tends to take on d4 and try to open the c file, try to put this knight on c4. This is one way of achieving counterplay. But perhaps the most direct threat is to go with c4, b5, a5, and b4, right? This is sort of black's most structured way to make concrete threats on the queen side. So Botvinnik actually anticipates that in this case and inserts the move a4, which I think is a really great move to, uh, to insert here for white. Now, it's not going to be necessary in every game in the f3 Nimzo in this type of structure, but I think here it, it is actually quite nice to play a4 just with the idea of stopping b5. Uh, now black continues with rook f to e8, and white plays queen d3 to add some support to the e3 pawn for the eventual push through with f3. Uh, we see c4 now by black. Uh, also, by the way, white was pressuring the knight. And so black commits to c4, shutting down the c file. Now, personally, I think maybe black should have kept the option open to take on d4 and play the move knight b8. The plan of coming out to a5, taking here, playing knight c4, I think this just tends to be a, a better way to find counterplay for black, because what black does in the game is simply far too slow. But c4, queen c2, now knight b8, rook a e1, adding support for the e pawn, knight c6, knight g3, knight a5, and now finally I can stop feeling like a fraud, 
Bafanik plays the move f3, and we are very much in a f3 Nimzo uh, position at this point. Uh, and now in the game, Capablanca sort of uh, goes, goes after this A-pawn that White spent a tempo on. And while this wins a pawn, uh, we'll see that Black's, or White's play in the center is so powerful that the A-pawn is, is just sort of irrelevant. It, it doesn't matter at all that White lost the A-pawn. The only purpose of this A-pawn was to slow down the pawn storm, and it has served that purpose uh, with great effect. Uh, so Capablanca tries knight b3, but now just a, uh, just pawn to e4. Uh, white breaks in the center, and this is enough to, to win the game. Queen takes a4 is Capablanca's idea, but now e5, knight d7, queen f2 is a nice little subtlety. Uh, uh, defending the d-pawn and preparing to push through with f4. And now quickly, I will show you guys the rest of the game. Uh, f4, black plays f5 because really there's nothing else you can do here, otherwise white's gonna play f5 and just checkmate you. So f5 should be tried. Now a really key move here by, by white, taking on f6 uh, on passant, uh, making sure we can still open files up on the side of the board where we have more space, especially when black's pieces are, are stranded over here on the queen's side. Knight takes f6, continue now with f5, take take, rookie eight, rookie six is a great move by Botvinnik, forcing Black to open up more files if he wants to continue trading pieces. Uh, in this case, he does, but now the threats against the king are going to be too much. King g7, queen f4 threatens to invade, queen e8, queen e5 pins the knight to the king, queen e7, and then if you guys want to try and find the move of the game, I would encourage you to pause here and think for hours and hours and hours about what the best move is going to be. Um, but if you just want to see the rest of the game, here it is. Last warning, pause now if you want to find it. The move of the game, bishop a3. Um, finally, we see this bishop coming into play and drawing the black queen way over back to the queen side. And this is, in fact, the, the death sentence for black. Uh, queen takes a3 is played. And the idea now is knight h5 check, queen g5 check, queen takes f6, e7. and queens or checkmate are unstoppable. Can't stop both of these ideas. Uh, Capablanca does have some checks though, and he does do his due diligence and plays those checks, but white picks up the pawn on h5, plays g4, and after king h5, the checks run out and Capablanca resigns. Uh, so why is this my favorite game in the quote-unquote F3 Nimzo? I know it didn't start in the F3 Nimzo, but we got there eventually. Well, it shows you the, the core problem for black in these, these most common F3 Nimzo lines. And that is, no matter what you're doing on the queen's side, white's play in the center is so severe that unless you were like literally making a queen on the queen's side, unless you literally break through with b4 and your c pawn is queening, then you're just going to get checkmated. Like, it's just tough. You just get checkmated. You can't stop it. And that's why the F3 Nimzo is so powerful and so great in a nutshell, is you just, you play e4, and it's just so difficult for black, right? If you achieve this move e4, uh, even at the cost of a pawn, even at the cost of some things on the queen side, you just win the game nine times out of 10. You just checkmate black practically. It's impossible to defend objectively, uh, you know, against, with perfect play, maybe like black can try and survive, but over the board, uh, telling you from experience, you just end up checkmating the guy so, so often. And that's what Botvinnik did here against Capablanca. Uh, if you want a more in-depth review of that game, by the way, I do think there is a game review on the YouTube channel uh, that I've done on this one where I go a little bit more in-depth. But like I said, probably my favorite game in the F3 Nimzo right there. Um, that's going to do it. That is going to uh, completely finish our series on the F3 Nimzo here. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun going through everything. Uh, and maybe, yeah, maybe I'll do like a, just a recap video where I talk about everything. But I'm not sure that'll be on Chess Openings Explained. I think it's time we moved on to something new next week. So thank you guys for writing out this F3 Nimzo journey with me. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. If you're watching live, please head on over to the Twitch channel for Tactics Time. For watching the YouTube version, once again, thank you so much for sticking out in this eight-part series. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.